Welcome to the Athlete Climate Academy, where we speak to athletes, scientists, and communicators about the important conversations that we need to have about the climate crisis. I'm really excited about our guest today. Estelle Chuck is someone I've known for many years, having bonded over a 10-day trip on a river that making educational material for schools. She's now an assistant producer at the BBC's Natural History Unit, a place renowned for the storytelling and natural history documentaries such as Plant Earth, Blue Planet, Frozen Planet, and Life, just to name a few. Estelle Croiso, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. It's good to be here and to talk to you. As you say, we've known each other yeah. for a while. Did we catch up? <laughs> it's been we've been trying to get you on the podcast for for an awfully long time, and um, yeah, because you're so busy as well uh, as assistant producer at Natural History Unit. I'm really happy to have you on. You tell us a little bit more about what you do um, at the Natural History Unit and and your path to it. Yeah, so I'm currently an assistant producer there, and I've been working at the Natural History Unit for. Goodness, it must be nearly nine years now, um, which is kind of scary, but brilliant as at the same time. Um, I started off as a researcher there working in natural history films, but actually more in kind of presenter led stuff and then kind of human conservation stories and documentaries. And then um, my most recent production that has gone out has been the Planet Earth 3 series with Dave Attenborough, um, which was, um, you know, a, mostly a natural history behavioural series. Um, but I also worked on the um, Conservation Heroes episode for that. So that was a really a very, very long um, project, but a really exciting one to work on and really proud of having seen it now, now gone out. Um, and now I'm currently working on a project that is being made by the BBC, but it's actually for National Geographic and it's all about Africa. So that's exciting, but it won't hit your screens for quite a few years yet. So, <laughs> yeah. That, that's the thing with these documentaries is such a, such a long lead time in them. Um, it must be quite exciting, though, to be working at the Natural History Unit. What's it like to be working there? Oh, it's it's brilliant. I think the thing which I love most about it is that you that people are just so passionate passionate about what they do. Um, you know, everyone's really passionate about the natural world and about um wild places and also what's happening to the to the planet as well. And really passionate about just trying to find the best ways of um of communicating that. And um I think that's what I find so encouraging about working there. And it's a very sort of supportive environment. And you know, we've got a lot of different talents as well. So, you know, some people are just unbelievably techie so I know everything about all these little weird bits of kit and other people are just much more you know they're the storytellers you know um and other people are just like real scientists so it's this kind of amazing collaboration trying to make these um these films the best they can be really yeah it's one of those weird places where I I heard a fact many years ago and I'm not even sure if it's true it was like a rumor that around 75 percent of natural history documentaries were made in that one little street in Bristol in England because of the Natural History Unit and all the other production companies that work there. I'm sure that's not a true fact. Don't, no, one, no one quote me on it. Um, but it is an, an unbelievable amount of natural history that comes out of White Ladies Road and that, that strip there with, where the Natural History Unit is, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Natural History Unit um, kind of, I guess it's, I suppose the BBC and I, so David, um, were, were kind of the people to make that genre such a big thing um and therefore i think that's why bristol has become this hub because that's where it all started um and you know with the bbc starting there and then of course um in i guess not many more recent years but people starting their own production companies um to produce this kind of content so yeah bristol's a real real hub um for it so it's a really exciting place to to work and you know you get people from all over the world working there now which is which is super cool and we're now actually that history unit is now based down in the center of bristol um so we actually left white ladies road a, a while back but um we're just like quite sad because it's it's a it's a very historic building it's been there for a long time but for sure what's in there now the same building what's in what's in that building yeah um, so some of the so um some of the news crews are still there, which is cool. Okay. Um, they've got a big news studio. Um, and then I'm not sure what's happening with the rest of the buildings. They're probably going to be sold off to you know, other other businesses, perhaps the university or something like that. But um, yeah, but they will that still. I think they will. They will keep the. Uh, I hope that the historic kind of front stays the same, you know, because that's been there for years and broadcasting house and all that sort of thing. So fingers crossed that will still remain. <laughs> it's one of those things that. You know, I I watch fewer natural history documentaries than I, than I used to because I I work in a, an adjacent field now making films and it always you come home at the end of the day and you turn on the TV, 
do I want to make, watch another natural history documentary or do I want to watch another documentary style thing? And there's so many of them out there now as well with, with all the different streamer services have them as well. But like you say, Sir David back, what, 1960, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and the natural history and it started that where it was a, it, it was a new thing at the time and it, we've shown over the past kind of 60 years or so the effect that, that can have on our planet. So a classic example of the effect of one of these documentaries, President Bush, a really kind of classic story, um, saw one of the Jean-Michel Cousteau documentaries and immediately afterwards went out to protect 140 square mile, 140,000 square miles of Pacific Ocean. Um, they do have, like you sit down, you watch one, they can have a real impact on you. And that's what the NHU has been doing for all that time. Um, Tell us a little bit about like how you think about the the impact documentaries can have on social consciousness and also like in real world consequences that people ha go out and, and take action. Yeah, I mean, that's always, I think for, I would say everyone that I work with, it is the ultimate goal is making a actual tangible dis different difference with the films that you're making. Um, and, you know, that is something that is actually quite hard to measure, but it's something like everyone's always striving for. Um, and I think that it's such an important thing to strive for because you do with these documentaries. I mean, whether it's a Sir David Attenborough documentary or something else, like the number of people watching it will you know, obviously vary vastly. Um, but you still have a captive audience of, of, of sorts who may or may not know about that topic. And so um, I just say to storytelling generally. I mean, we evolve telling each other stories and therefore influencing one another. And so it's just a kind of, it's a, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, native way of trying to communicate um, problems that are happening. And I think it's, um, you know, a really important way of changing people's behaviour. And I think trying to think about examples, I mean, specifically one from that history, and I think that a lot of people know is the one, of, uh, you know, I think Blue Planet 2 had a huge impact on, people's consciousness about plastic I think there was a a huge um you know there was already that kind of zeitgeist in the air I think where we realized that this you know ocean plastic as well as just river plastic etc and, and rubbish was a huge problem um and there were lots of people trying to push for changes in policy like paying for plastic bags you know banning of plastic straws that sort of thing but when that, when that documentary came out, it reached, you know, millions and millions of people and people who perhaps would not have engaged with that, not because they didn't want to, it was just not part of their their thoughts. But, you know, they sit down on a Sunday with their family and they watch that. And, you know, within, you know, within a year of that documentary going out, there was, you know, bans on plastic six straws. There was uh, plastic, you know, the plastic bike levy came in. That was certainly I wouldn't I would never want to say that it was just due to that documentary because there's there was a lot of people fighting for that already. But I think it really changed a policy in a, in a sense, but also people's people's actions. Um, and then you have other documentaries like, I mean, Blackfish, for example. I think before that came out, I don't think anyone realised the impact that these Sea World esque um, sort of or uh, facilities were having on on these very sentient beings, you know, people just went there yeah. and enjoyed it. And I'm sure like we were all probably guilty of that. And I think it really, it's really shone the light on that. Made people realize that this is maybe not the best practice really. Um, so yeah, I think it's got a, I think they have a very big role to play. Definitely. It's one of those things where they can have a big role to play. I certainly remember the uh, Blue Planet, two coming out and the the plastics i was working with the team at the time that were trying to get rid of plastic straws and it seemed like overnight that kind of like um that switch uh just flicked over to yeah. people saying okay we need to get rid of these now um yeah. obviously now i i barely see plastic straws in in the in the uk when i travel around the world i see them here and there but not a lot they're not a lot of of ocean plastics and i think sometimes we can get distracted by the the zero point zero one percent compared to like the bigger things like I'd love Coca Cola to not be making three billion plastic bottles every year rather than us getting rid of a few plastic straws, but that way of getting people ever being like a uh, a gate or like a gateway into caring about this kind of stuff and like you say with things like Blackfish there was a documentary recently in the UK 
all about quite niche about the post office scandal, which happened um, a long, uh, quite a few years ago now, over a decade ago. People lobbying for, about it for a long time, talking about it in the news and stuff. Nothing really happened. And then this documentary got made and it all changed. Yeah. It's just a really, really good story, really good documentary can be so empowering and can change everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, I mean, I'd heard bits and bobs about the post on the scandal, but I'd never heard that. But when I watched that, I mean, I, my, I mean, I was in tears for some of it. And like, but, but I think what's so engaging about that is it's, it is a, like, a, it's a really people focused story. And it's, it's an amazing story, really, of like, kind of a David versus Goliath. And that's sort of a very traditional story that we, we can all engage with in a way. Um, so it, I think it's 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 done a very good job and like tapping into people's emotions and you feel for those people and you're like I want to fight for them too sort of thing and I think that's what documentaries should be trying to do is just engender like a a motivation for people to try and do something. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's a and also it was it was quite hopeful. I mean, I think there was obviously a terrible thing that happens in any of those Ghostbusters, um, but you know at the end you sort of see that they they are they are nearly winning. Um, and yeah. so there's, I think hope is a very important thing to be trying to communicate, which is very difficult for quite a lot of like, particularly environmental uh, issues. Um, but I think without that, people just kind of lose motivation as well. Yeah, this, and, and to be specific, that's a, that was a dramatized version of a, a documentary. Yeah. So a little bit different from like a, a, a true to life documentary. It was based on true events and I think everything in it was, was pretty much true. But, you know, injecting hope into that is the same as injecting hope into the stuff that you work on at the Natural History Unit. You know, there's always, and everyone I speak to who works at the BBC and on these other documentaries, there's always, right, we got to tell people what's actually happening. Um, we can't really sugarcoat it too much, but we need to put a hopeful spin on it. You know, studies have shown that we can't, if people are more willing to change their minds and engage with stuff, if they have empathy towards things. So creating that empathy is absolutely key in, in documentaries that you make and others make, but then that call to action, that thing of how we change stuff is also important and that can't happen without hope. So how do you go about balancing, like showing in these documentaries, the actual true realities of stuff, some of which I can't watch, especially when, when small chicks get thrown out of the nests and stuff. I'm, I need to fast forward through that part, but that's the natural yeah. world. But then the mm. hopeful side of it as well, like the energy always comes around to like right at the end, showing us a bit of glimmer of hope, which I think we need. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 a, it's a really challenging thing because you don't, you definitely don't want to be, as you say, sugarcoating is a very good word because that's the last thing that we we want to. Do. But, um, but I would say from a from having worked in this sort of industry for what nine years now, I haven't spent quite a lot of time with of that looking into not just like wildlife behavior stories, but also how wildlife is being impacted by 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 um, the environment, by uh, our kind of actions and also what people are doing to do that, to, to protect that and to stop those um, those things happening. Like I feel myself that, you know, I, I could be very down eye about the state of the planet, but I think because I've looked into so much of this, I my, my real feeling is that there is a lot, there is a lot of hope because there's so many people fighting for for the the future of our planet and to be fr quite frank that's kind of you know, there's barely any other very, very few places in the natural world now that are untouched by humans so it's kind of up to us to do something about it i think what was really interesting about what you're saying is that when you know whenever episode thunder three is quite a good example like I, I think all of us, in, you know, watch the Twitter feed extensively whenever these these shows were going out, and um, and just the reviews as well. Like, you know, I we really wanted to know what people thought, and um, the reviews were really good, which was great. But you know, there was definitely like people saying, you know, I just I just find it a bit. You know, the first episode of Planet Earth was was great, but it was a bit depressing. Like, do you think all of them are going to be a bit like that? Yeah. And then I think our very last episode was um it was the heroes episode and there was a really great like um goggle box about it. And uh, you know, the I know obviously goggle box isn't completely, you know, I know that they're kind of G'd up a bit, these people that are doing it, but you know, it's still quite a good reflection of what people think. And I think one of them said something like when the heroes episode started, they sort of made this comment of, 
oh yeah here's all the nice things but here's how they're all being destroyed in this kind of like and it's all your fault kind of like kind of sarky comment and you just think oh gosh I really hope that's not how they feel watching this um but then by the end they were I think you know you could see that they're really enjoying the kind of stories that were coming out of it so it's a very hard thing hard balance to 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 strike and I think when it came to the heroes episode and specifically like we didn't want to just end that documentary saying, you know, we've all got a part to play in this, you know, everyone kind of do something kind of thing. We wanted to, you know, be real about the realities of what happens on the planet. And quite frankly, I think we all know that obviously we all do have a part to play, but there's certain people in society and groups in society that do have bigger spheres of influence, like politicians and business leaders. And if, you know, if they get behind these kind of, you know, you just mentioned uh, President Bush. Like, if they get behind these kind of these kind of issues, then you know, they can make a huge difference compared to any of us. And so, our kind of, um, I guess, our sort of duty, if you will, is I guess trying to get those people into power or supporting those people or not. We just felt like that was a better way to end something because it gives people, you know, there is something you can support particular um, organizations but at the same time it's not saying to the general person just you know sitting at home on a Sunday like you know you got to do something and and it's all up to you kind of thing <laughs> so yeah it's a very hard thing to pin I think to, to get right and I think a lot of people struggle with it so yeah <laughs> yeah having that that we talked to a lot of um athletes about what they can do and um, there is an, like an outsized influence of you don't want to tell people they can't do anything because that's quite defeatist. But at the same time, you have to be real that some people, President Bush, when he, he was in office, can go out and sign an executive order and save 140,000 square miles of Pacific Ocean. There's the amount of effort you, that you put into something is relative depending on who you are and the privilege that you have. So I think, I honestly think that for some people, going out and like taking part in a beach cleanup is the same relative effort and um and sizable contribution as president bush got out and signing that declaration you know um yeah. and the platform that you guys have is quite privileged because planet earth 3 is seen around the world like it's an international audience there's loads loads of eyes on it and things but that does come at a bit of a cost you know there's a great quote from i think it's from racing extinctions director uh louisa hoyas uh who says one of the one of the worst things you can do for the climate is make a climate change documentary yeah, you know, the yeah. places you have to go the kit that you have to use i've seen some of the like the setups and you can spend weeks in one location and you know have to fly all this kit to diff different places around the world we have athletes who fly different places for races for, for work and stuff a lot of them get called hypocrites because of the hey we we care about the climate but also we're going to take a flight to this location how do you deal with that um in your head of like i'm making a, a something that's a, that i you know i want to say about plastics for example i'm making a, a documentary about plastics but i use plastic cups and you know uh coffee cups and things i i think i ignore that quite a lot because i don't think it's helpful for the the, the good that i'm trying to do um, but how do you deal with it? And how does the natural history start to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you are totally right in that it, it does, it is in a sense kind of quite hypocritical that you're burning up all this carbon by bringing all this stuff across the world. And, you know, we have to do that to make these make these films. And um, I think a lot of people that work in this industry do sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable about it because, you know, you look at your air miles and it's like, fly me, <laughs> what am I doing here? Um, but... You know, I think, um, as you say, like without doing that, you know, going to that location or, you know, filming that, you know, sperm whale that's got plastic all around its uh, tail or whatever, you know, you can't get those stories out there. So it's tricky. But the thing which is, I feel like is, I think it's something that the Natural History Unit and I'd say probably most of the other production companies in Bristol and probably across the UK are very aware of is, is their carbon, particularly their carbon impact. Um, for the for their shoots, um, and um, just taking something to see. I mean, before we do any shoot, we have to extensively go through. Is there any archive that exists of this place? Is it accessible? And you actually have to kind of we call it like the carbon assessment, and you have to really like challenge yourself on the ways you're getting places, or are you using a helicopter, or can you not just use a drone? Like you have to have a real reason to be using a helicopter. 
Um, so that's really good because it forces everyone to do that prior to a shoot. And then afterwards, when we come back, we do these sort of like totals and we, we're what we're doing across the unit is trying to work out where to reduce those those costs to the to the planet basically um and also i think you know as we spoke before um what I spoke about before was that you know the natural history unit sort of established itself in bristol david attenborough and you know being in the uk sort of started that genre and therefore i think for many years all the talent came from the uk because that's where it all started and um and i think more and more now i I guess maybe because camera kit is becoming a lot more accessible to people. You have YouTube, you have Instagram, you've got ways of people getting out their own content. Um, you have such amazing filmmakers all over the world who are, who are kind of trailblazers in their in culture. So we're using um, remote operators a lot more now. And I, I think obviously COVID had a big thing to do with that. And I think in that was one of the weird blessings of COVID is that it was like, we can do this and these people are very, very good. We have kit houses in some... Like, you know, if we're, if we're filming in, let's say, Africa loads, we try and establish a bit of a kit house there so we're not flying stuff over. Um, and there's a really amazing project that's being started by the BBC. And I think other production companies probably do the same called Project Songbird, which is the sp specific remit is to train in-country talent. Because uh, it shouldn't just be people from, from Bristol or the UK flying everywhere um, and do, making this stuff because it's, you know, we... Yeah, I think from a cultural point of view, we can never, having not grown up in a particular place, you can you can't appreciate all the nuances, um, and so these people who are local are much better doing that, and also it reduces the carbon a lot. So yeah, I think it's something that people are thinking more and more about, and for good reason, because <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a great. Like that's I totally I mean that that quote is is a great one because yeah it's it's quite costly to plot it, but in a good way i think so you know. yeah we often talk about like our carbon handprint versus our carbon footprint like the, the you know when you have a carbon footprint what is the good that you're doing to to offset that you know are you are you traveling across the world but essentially like shining a light on something that uh, people wouldn't know about otherwise that's a that's a a good kind of offset for it i think to to share those kind of stories and it's one that we always tell our, our athletes you know if you go into a location spend a bit more time there um get involved um you know tell some stories from that location uh spread the the stories of what's happening there with climate change and the likes so there's there's lots of ways that we can start telling those those stories and we see it more and more now on the plethora of streaming services that we seem to all be paying for per month um that is always a new subscription to to have there seems to be more documentaries out there than, than ever before more stories than ever before do you think that's a good thing that we're getting so much of it or do you think some of the more important ones just get get lost do you think that some voices are louder than others you know uh traditionally like western voices like outweighing the more regional voices from from around the world or yeah, is it more the merrier or not? Is it what I'm trying to get at? Hmm, it's a really good question. I mean, it does, I think, overwhelm people to know what they should be watching. And I think there is obviously a bit of a, um, possibly a bit of a bias in what people watch because, you know, the big production houses and commissioners, you know, be that BBC or National Geographic and or, you know, Netflix, Apple, you know, they have huge, huge marketing budgets so they can push those films and therefore do drive a bigger audience in some ways but the you know the power of something like a you a youtube youtuber um who has you know millions and millions of viewers every day is and also people who really trust them yeah, as a person you know i think that's one of the things which is quite unique about youtube is that often these people who are who are big on it are people that their viewers trust and feel like almost like, they, like they're, they're their friends and therefore they want to see anything that they do you know and so um they have a huge influence and they can probably change a lot of minds very 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 quickly compared to perhaps a more traditional documentary where people perhaps feel a little bit less connected with the people or the animals or whatever it is that they're seeing so yeah i think it's a i mean is it too much i it's a sort of hard to say really i mean i think the more people kind of beating the drum for climate change um and for climate change mitigation and uh like protecting our planet the better really you know um yeah i don't see any harm in that really <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that there's it's all it's all too much for all of us at the moment. You know, it seems kind of mm-hmm. at the other end of COVID, with all, all the social media and and just having to keep an eye on everything, it all feels uh, feels a little bit much. Um, yeah. So, what what do you think? You know, going forward, if we're all trying to play our part, what do you think some of the big challenges we face when trying to kind of get our message out and communicating about the climate crisis, but also biodiversity loss, see new numbers all the time of like how dire it is. What do you think is the big challenge going forward to to turn that uh, consciousness into some kind of action? Just a little small question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I'd do that. I wish I knew the answer because, you know, I'd be... I'd, uh, I'd be able to change the world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about using... Well, from my perspective, for example, it's about using storytelling skills in various different ways to communicate something that is happening, but also the solutions. I think like the solutions part is the, for me actually, for as a viewer, is one of the most important things that that we can do. So I think, trying to think of two good examples, like there is the, um, is it it called 24? I don't know if you've seen the film 2040, which is all of this, this man who has a, I think his daughter, it's a very sweet film and that he, he is imagining the world whenever she is like you know 60 or 70 or something like that and you know there's he he can imagine this dire world for her but then also this amazing world and in that documentary he goes and he looks at what solutions are and technologies are sort of developing to i don't know capture carbon or whatever it is and so you get this kind of very hopeful outlook on the future of the planet um, and I think the other documentary that did that very well was actually Sir David's Life on Our Planet um, sort of witness statement because, you know, that the first half of that film, so it's beautiful because it's all about him and his his sort of, you know, his his life. But then he's saying, you know, I've seen this planet like, be destroyed in my lifetime. And he's like, but, you know, there is there is hope. And it didn't, it wasn't just that this is hope and, you know, great, that's the end of the film. It was like, these are actually the tangible things that are happening. And it wasn't just, you know, someone, um, it wasn't just, you know, individuals in certain places doing really cool things, which I think is very important to show. But I think it's, he was showing, you know, big industry scale stuff. For me as a viewer, that felt like, yes, there is there is um, a future. I think it's the motivation, motivating people to do something is the, is the key thing. And I think the only way you can do that is by showing them examples of what either they can do or giving them hope that there is a future because otherwise you'd be sort of sitting there thinking, well, you know, there's nothing really I can do. I'm just going to keep living my life the way, the way I'm, I'm living it. And um, um, so, yeah, I think hope and motivation are, are the, are the key things. And, you know, we all, like, yeah, as I said, like we all, we've all grown up on stories and we can relate to those kind of things. So it's just trying to find the best stories and the best people to tell them really. Yeah. One of the things that we're always trying to kind of give our athletes some top tips and uh, some ways that they can go about doing that, the our our top tip normally is going back to have conversations about stuff, whether it's on the ski lift or whether it's you know uh, on the running track or or wherever apres ski whatever. Um, have yeah. these conversations and and meet people where they are when they're telling you about their their life stories and the things that they that they've seen. Um, any kind of best practices in making videos and sharing stories to create an impact from the natural history unit? Um, what are some good things that people can can think about? I suppose ending on a hopeful note is going to be going to be one of them. Yeah, yeah, that that. But I also think that you know we there's you know when you think about the movies that you that you love, you know, like traditional love stories. Um, David versus Goliath, detective stories, that sort of thing. Like I think often when I'm thinking about sequences or ways of telling, doing a film or a story, like I'm trying to think about those traditional ways that we absorb stories and that we, what really engages us as people, and finding stories that fall not necessarily fall into those genres, but that you can tap into those kind of natural feelings is I think very important and a very good way of getting people engaged in the story because people will will naturally feel more emotionally attached to something if if it's kind of like a love story or and that can just be someone um you know someone's love of a uh, utter love of a place or you know on a mission to find I remember one story that 
I remember the BBC doing this was ages ago. Was, I think it was like on Big Cat. It was a Big Cat three partner, and one of the um, stories that they told was a scientist who was just on this mission to find uh, to camera trap this uh, very rare species of cat, which I can't remember which cat it was. Not terribly. And it was like he was like in in love with this cat, like he was never going to stop until he found this cat. And you know, it's it's kind of like a very simple story, but it was almost like this little love story. He was on un, unrequited love, you know. Um, he loved this cat, I didn't love him back, kind of thing. And I know it sounds silly, but I think that is just naturally what is sto- how, stories that we we are naturally very very attracted to. Um, and I think if we can somehow sort of mold our climate change or environmental stories into that sort of thing i can think it can really capture people's attention but yeah i think you're totally right just having conversations with people as well and these athletes who are going all going all over the world but also you know talking to people who are obviously really into the sport that they're doing but maybe are less not not into environmental problems but i guess less engaged with them for many reasons i mean that's 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 a really great thing to be able to do is just kind of start the conversation and get the brains the brain juices going you know <laughs> yeah i think that that love for that love and that passion and the conversations go hand in hand our athletes have tons of really good conversations but absolutely love the the planet that they that we call our quote unquote playground um so they're naturally right. disposed to having these conversations and and getting that passion across uh, i think we're in a good good spot we we do enjoy hearing about what our athletes are getting up to uh estelle chuck is assistant producer at the bbc's natural history unit what a wonderful conversation estelle thank you so much for being on the podcast oh thanks for having me here